So we begin now with uh, the keynote by Tim Ejevec, uh, Vice President Products of Xilinx. Uh, thank you, Tim, for coming. So thank you. Tim is from San Jose. Thank you. Well, thank you all for having us here this week. The um, past few days, at least from a few of us, I came from the Bay Area and San Jose, uh, very informative and actually reinforces some of the things that we had been seeing to build products that I'm going to talk about here today uh, with a different perspective than what you may have heard from Yusuf yesterday. So I titled our presentation here, Smarter, Connected, and Differentiated, in that over the past I'd say two or three years at Xilinx, we uh, have started this journey to rebrand the company a, a little bit from the standpoint, uh, which I heard yesterday uh, many times, is uh, Xilinx is an FPGA company. Um, we started to use a different term called the all programmable company. And the reason that we're, we're doing that is I think as you see the, the, you know, our view of the trends that are occurring, the amount of integration and technology that's going to go in our parts are no longer just uh, blank logic cells or LUTs and memory. It's going to take much more to be able to achieve some of the things that are emerging. So what I'm going to do here is not talk about specifically the uh, A&D segments or anything um, that is directly to the technology that Yusuf talked about yesterday. I'm going to talk about the base foundation that uh, we build off of to get there, both on the silicon side, software, and framework side. So with that, I think you, some of you may have seen this yesterday. Um, our history at Xilinx is we're in many markets, as you may know. Uh, we like to think we have 20,000 customers at any one time and see about every application in the world as it emerges. Now, the challenge for us is to uh, be able to participate in those applications when they go into production, but typically, you know, from our inception, prototyping and uh, starting a design effort with our devices is what about everyone in this industry does. So I talk about that because we tend to see trends that emerge at any one given time, and over the past few years, the trends have been just uh, accelerating at a pace that I think many of us haven't seen before. So part of this definition, if you will, for Xilinx in this new all programmable world is to look at the mega trends that you know, most of the industry really adopted, but we see as driving the underlying technology, which I'll talk about at a, at a lower level, to be able to fulfill some of the needs of these trends. So you know, obviously cloud computing is exploding and it's touching everything. I know the session after this, the panel, is going to talk about the impact of cloud computing in the uh, A&D environment as well. Obviously, in its infancy right now, and uh, many, many years in front of us to be able to fulfill the needs of what that represents. Uh, for uh, technology that we're seeing that I'll show you is that that acceleration is already permeated in just about every other application that we see. So uh, a lot of the fundamentals of acceleration, signal processing, large amounts of data needed for bandwidth, real-time processing, affects all these other areas as well. The next one is embedded vision. Again, an offshoot from a lot of things happening in the cloud. Uh, this is uh, a fundamental area of machine learning and being able to use now uh, many different cycles of bandwidth in our silicon, or any silicon, as well as uh, memory interfaces to be able to perform the functions that are going to be needed for this area. We kind of think of this as a very broad technology, vision, um, making machines that see, obviously, impact many different markets. Uh, I would say about five or six years ago, we uh, co-sponsored something called the Embedded Vision uh, Forum with uh, a group in San Francisco. It allowed us to get our feet wet, if you will, and start to bring some standards with a consortium of uh, worldwide companies to help proliferate this technology to applications. I'll talk a little bit more about this because obviously a, a significant topic as we go forward. IoT, we call it industrial IoT. We tend not to make products that sit in the handset from a power standpoint. Ours are a little bit more power hungry. So in the industrial space, anything that is going to have a lot of sensors, sensor fusion, uh, is something that we see in about every application as we go forward. And that's primarily the, the ubiquitous play 
we see the industry uh, taking there. And the final one is 5G. Again, this technology of communication it has gone everywhere. And as this has emerged and the hope for 5G that uh, this brings, the acceleration has happened. So, you know, I think back just a few years ago, 5G was something that was happening, you know, post-2020 and the emergence of, of things based on when the standard was going to be ratified. Well, uh, customers didn't wait, and they're not waiting. So, you know, things like pre-5G started, and the acceleration has happened. So, again, when you look at the technology needed for the underlying pieces, it'll be something that goes across all of these uh, particular megatrends. Fundamentally, we need more bandwidth. So kind of this chart, as we look at it at Xilinx, is you know, some areas that um, we need to address or the hope for each one of these megatrends is going to be stalled. Uh, however you look at it, whether you build your own ASICs, custom parts, but these things need to be addressed. The amount of bandwidth, the amount of uh, processing power, low latency, has uh, escalated, not linear, by the amount of data that needs to be processed. So, you know, at the bottom we show kind of memory. You know, memory over the past few years, the roadmap is kind of uh, really stalled from what's after DDR4. Well, there's a roadmap, but the uh, pace doesn't keep up with the demands that are going to be needed from the processing point. When you see the nonlinear functions of things like the DSP capacity needed, include Ethernet here because packet, packetization of things like the wired infrastructure cable is happening. Um, these technologies are going to need to be fed and that's where the memory hierarchies come into play and I want to address that here shortly in, in our discussion here. So with that, two things to remember if, if you leave here for Xilinx and I think the industry is, you know, folks look at us as a, a silicon company and while that's true, uh, in our transformation, we have to become a software company, and we're well on that way. We have a growing team here in Hyderabad, and we're committed to uh, our, our facility here, and it will continue to grow. A lot of silicon focus, a lot of our new parts have actually taped out from this facility over the past few years, and they're, they're really groundbreaking parts. But we're also ramping on the software side, on infrastructure that traditionally uh, wasn't part of our language, but it's absolutely needed as we go forward to you know, fulfill the promise of some of these megatrends and technologies. So, you know, a little bit about this slide that's significant. Yusuf showed it yesterday, but, you know, our, our journey here on a transformation started when we went to a 28 nanometer node. We, we really changed our architecture. It's where we brought out the first SOC, uh, where we brought out some technology called Stacked Silicon Interconnect, or 3DIC, to allow us to make very large uh, FPGAs. The reason we did all that is because Moore's Law, which the industry has talked about, is uh, running out of gas for us. And clearly, just by uh, going to the next node and taping out silicon doesn't deliver the bandwidth, DSP performance, processing performance, uh, transceiver performance that need, that's needed for the next generation applications. So we needed to make a change. At the same time, it's that red bubble on this slide, uh, we had to retool a tool flow, and we invested a lot of time, I call that investing in the plumbing, if you will, where um, the tool flow to be able to handle the capacity, the bandwidth, as well as very large designs needed to change, or you couldn't be productive in getting a design to uh, place and route and, and work on our parts. Since we made that, those changes, we're on a trajectory now to keep on incrementing uh, on these three vectors, the standard silicon platform, the SOC, and these uh, 3DIC devices as we go forward to address those megatrends. The second thing that we're doing currently is, uh, that I'll show you is to make it, try to make this stuff easier for users. So, you know, if there's anything the cloud and the acceleration has really provided over the past uh, 12 to 18 months is the amount of frameworks and software infrastructure that have just emerged. Um, a lot of this maybe was in university and now it's being proliferated, proliferated faster than um, we can see into experiments in the cloud companies. Most recently, since really this past year in uh, the November time frame, Amazon made an announcement where they really broke the broke through here with the mold of their AWS acceleration using an FPGA and this infrastructure. 
But I can tell you as on a regular basis, that innovation continues. So their ask to us is to make it easier for their software engineers to use silicon devices. So as we go forward, uh, our goal, and this is kind of what I'm showing you as uh, internal Zeitling's goals here, is to expand our user base. Um, I talked to some of the folks here, and uh, again, using the term FPGA, the folks that have used our, our devices, you have FPGA experts, RTL experts, silicon experts. Uh, equally, what uh, we see being leveraged is the software teams being able to program the registers in frameworks that they're used to. So that's one of the clear initiatives and commitments that we have. So with that, we introduced a couple of things. One called SD SOC. It's for these embedded developers, the uh, embedded vision type of applications, IoT application, in a framework that folks are used to to get to our SOC devices. And then the second one to the far left here is SDXL. This is for primarily targeted at that Amazon type of customer working in OpenCL and an abstraction type of environment where, again, they don't want to close timing, worry about uh, LUTs and such in a device. They just want to use it and program it and unlock the performance that we have targeted for each one of these megatrends. Most recently, we've announced some things that go beyond this. And you kind of take this tool environment, which is the SDXL, SDSOC, and we add some stacks to it again, to abstract even more from uh, the actual tool flow itself. So what ends up happening is once we, I call it the mundane, uh, figure out things that every application will need, what our goal now is to just provide it as part of the solution to uh, designers versus they have to go through and redesign a PCIe interface or go through and redesign base code for an operating system. We're delivering that with this base platform in a software standpoint. On the acceleration wave, why this is important is when we look at what's happening in the cloud, we break it into three areas. There's a storage piece. Again, that's memory, right? Bandwidth and data where stuff has to be retrieved as quickly as possible as, as well as stored. The uh, video processing, transcoding, uh, big driver of why the cloud's even uh, exploding. You know, in the US worldwide, things like YouTube and what Google's doing is really driving bandwidth and, you know, it, uh, depending on where, where you live in, in uh, parts of the country, you just don't have enough bandwidth to keep up today. So uh, that is a area of uh, performance and bandwidth as well. And then the final one is machine learning. So the intelligence for things to make decisions of, you know, on the side of training and inference is pervasive. Um, we were just talking earlier on uh, multiple applications, maybe started with AI and, you know, in uh, heavy compute type boxes, but uh, embedded applications we're seeing in, you know, things like video teleconferencing now. I mean, low-end video teleconferencing uh, machines having uh, machine learning in it, so they can size up the room, figure out who's there, track your voice, apply it, and then move a camera within the room automatically. That's already happening which means that base technology needs to scale to a more robust, if you will, and uh, volume-driven type of environment. Part of the hope and challenge here is to take the base processing power that typically these machines have been um, run by you know, standalone CPUs, uh, Xeon-class kind of products, and give acceleration to it. So you know, over the last 12 months, we broke out in our areas of, of um, acceleration, different types of application where we're seeing you know, anywhere from an 18 times to 84 times advantage of performance by implementing acceleration, not only with hardware, but with the software tools that we talk about. So this is what's driving the hyperscale workloads and will continue. And again, monthly, right, folks are coming out with the uh, ability to use these workloads on the major platforms by every vendor in the cloud uh, today. The uh, slide that I have here about embedded vision, there's just one key takeaway here for, we call it revision, for, um, for yourselves is, you know, in the past, FPGA is really, you, you thought of as flexible and programmable. As we go to this SOC, all programmable environment, 
One of the things that is all programmable is connectivity, meaning I.O., get things in and out of our devices. Many different sensors are emerging, again, on a you know, uh, regular basis. Many different interfaces, and what uh, we have the ability to do is program those interfaces and allow change to occur as this industry is emerging. Um, this is uh, you know, one of the key advantages, I think, of being early adopters in all those markets I showed on the first slide is it's this kind of technology we see in every one of the markets. Everyone has the same challenge of, well, if you can give me the performance, you know, uh, there's another way I can get the performance, but I'm interfacing to a new interface, new sensor. How do I do that? Uh, typically, that's where this programmable I.O. and connectivity comes into play. So again, from the smarter standpoint, the AI piece, the connected standpoint means programmable interfaces, programmable I.O. In the case of the vision, we call it sensor fusion. The last thing I want to touch on is, you know, again, an area that's a challenge for the industry, and that's the uh, insatiable bandwidth. And there's two things, right? There's bandwidth to be able to feed real-time engines, and then the latency to be able to get the data when you need it. So, you know, traditionally, I'm showing different types of memory that, you know, not only are in our parts, SOCs, FPGAs, but any ASIC and such, where um, there'll be a little bit of memory on, on board, caches, we call distributed memory, block RAM, uh, we had some other deep buffers, and then there's external memory, right? So um, going forward, uh, we added something called Alteram, which is just a little bit more memory on our device. You know, clearly the industry sees the hope behind uh, integrating or using the HBM technology for increased bandwidth. So, you know, simple chart here shows the different options going forward from technology standpoint. And you can see from the HBM, just on, I try to keep an apples apples com uh, comparison, you know, 480 gigabyte per second versus, you know, down to 21. It's an order of magnitude better. So obviously this has a lot of hope and buzz in the industry. Uh, part of our challenge now is to make it real. And, you know, clearly in the aerospace and defense areas, we see uh, many applications in uh, not only the compute portion of it, but uh, some of the things Yusuf was showing yesterday for HBM. How we're approaching it is based on, I think, really how everyone will approach it from the standpoint, these won't be monolithic kind of devices, one die. They're multiple die, right? Where the memory vendors are gonna supply the uh, memory, the silicon, the actual stacks for the HBM, and then the silicon suppliers need to hook it up to the silicon. So one of the things that we did early from the slide that I showed you earlier was develop this technology of 3DIC, SSIT, uh, stack silicon interconnect technology, it's called. It was the ability to take different types of devices, different die, bring them together and package them and uh, not sacrifice performance where maybe other technologies in the past uh, had a trade-off. Our HBM technology will be based on that third generation, we call it, and this is actually uh, uh, COAS, which was developed in conjunction, we were the leading vendor with us in 28 nanometer with TSMC. Um, but what we're gonna do then is take one of our devices, our SOC devices, FPGA devices, and then, as we as you see in the bottom of this picture, include the HBM stacks. That allows us to do a couple of things. One is unlock that bandwidth and low latency that you saw in the, la the previous slide. And then secondly, we'll have a memory controller available so that as a user and use ease of use, you don't have to worry about getting to that memory. You don't have to design it. It's available. Now, uh, there's a race to this technology. Right? Many vendors in, uh, in fact, I think all silicon vendors in the, in the world are looking at doing this if they haven't done it already. And it's just a matter of time to work out some of these uh, you know, technical details where we productize something versus just make the uh, first prototype, which is you know, a bit different to make 10 of these versus 10,000 of them, right? So it's just a matter of time, and uh, this one will be coming from us here uh, sampling next year. That will address the, uh, the high bandwidth issues. The last thing I want to address, which again we talked of yesterday, is um, some you know, homegrown technology, if you will, some investments we, we made as a company you know, eight to 10 years ago. So uh, we had actually brought on a team 
of analog designers, RF designers, to go off and create some very high-speed data converters. And the value for us doing this, if you see on this whole integration play, and needing high bandwidth, right? I mean, first thing you need to do is take an analog signal, convert it to digital, and now we start processing. Well, you know, part of the challenge, again, as uh, the, the bandwidth and frequencies and needs have emerged, is making that efficient. So interfaces have been developed. Uh, those interfaces start to have, you know, choke points from the amount of bandwidth as well as power consumption issues. So we invested in deploying this uh, and developing this analog technology. In 2012, we had a first test chip. We took that SSIT technology, that 3DIC I just spoke of, we took one of our Vertex FPGAs and married it to two DI, uh, an AD, an A to D converter and a D to A converter on that silicon and basically debugged this platform. What we found, however, by doing that is it wasn't as efficient as we needed to have it for some of the applications that are driving this bandwidth. Radio, radar, many applications for this. So we went on a journey then to uh, tape out a part, actually integrate it in a monolithic device. We announced that technology, I think it was February of this year, and we'll be doing a formal product announcement of really what that device looks like and the specs and such uh, by the end of this year. Um, we think this has a lot of hope for the industry because it lowers power consumption significantly. And one of the target markets uh, that, you know, we uh, supply to is uh, that 5G radio, wireless, as well as, uh, you know, communication markets in the A and D space. Footprint always matters. This addresses footprint as well. So two key metrics, power, footprint, and deliver the performance that, that's required for the bandwidth. So um, I like to talk about this, in fact, we were talking about this with the team a bit, is the risk that we took on delivering this or deliver, developing it was kind of built on the foundation from where I started on that first slide with the lines and that red ball where, you know, we, we got some base technology. We had an SOC that had, uh, you know, many different cores, ARM cores, uh, our partner. Uh, in the SOC, um, had caches, all the peripherals you can think of, the GTs, many hardened features. We take that base technology and marry it up to this analog technology. And what that does, and what we've already seen here with this uh, particular product, is lowers the power as well as uh, delivers to this footprint significantly. So depending on the application, I think I have a range here, but you know, depending on the application, you know, truly we see between 30 to 70% 70, 70 power reduction. And from the footprint size, obviously it is what it is, meaning that as many as uh, A to D and D to A converters you needed outside, those aren't no longer needed as long as the spec of ours and the number of channels meet your needs. So um, this is one that I've I didn't have uh, yesterday and after talking with folks in this deck, I would have been remiss of not talking about it because it's coming. We think it'll have a significant impact and we've heard some of the feedback from folks here as well in um, the A&D space global, globally and we look forward to being able to support your needs here as you go forward. So finally in wrapping and maybe there's a few minutes for questions, um, you know, I'm, I just want to leave with this slide here of this whole smarter, connected, and differentiated type of approach. And um, while we're still on our learning curve, and it will be non, uh, it'll be a non-ending learning curve for support. You know, please think of Xilinx as a partner of not only for silicon and hardware, but to deliver to your needs of software framework infrastructures to be able to meet some of the objectives on these megatrends. So with that, thank you. A couple of more minutes for uh, Q and A. Any questions? Let's. Any question? Yeah. So the 16 nanometer RF chip that was talked of, it's now commercially offered. It was tested as per the slide in 2016. So. Um, we haven't announced it yet. It's not commercially offered. We're going to be making that announcement by the end of this year. 
Okay. What we have is the test chip, we have the technology in-house, and uh, very soon we'll uh, make the announcement and it'll be offered for sampling. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, KK. Yeah. So, uh, just a question, uh, whether uh, Jailink is, uh, is, is participating in any collaborative development, product development plan in India? Is there any product development plan in India? So product development uh, is significant part of our, our uh, representative team here from our Hyderabad office. So we actually develop some of these products right here, the actual silicon. We also develop the software here, various uh, portions of the software that I was showing you. And, um, you know, quite honestly, you know, my view, Xilinx's view, there's really uh, no end in sight. We're committed to um, Hyderabad and our facility, and we're, and we're growing fairly rapidly. So I would say maybe four years ago, and one of my team members could help me, uh, four or five years ago, we actually taped out our first device that went to production here from the Hyderabad facility, and that was a first for us. Previously, uh, if not all of it, it was done out of San Jose. Okay. One last question. Yeah. Ishan? Um, so, uh, you spoke about the, uh, the AI ML accelerators uh, that, that are being worked on. Uh, more specifically with the revision framework. Uh, other than, uh, you know, the cloud infrastructure on the edge node side, what are the top two or three applications that you're seeing where, uh, you know, there is potential to apply AI or ML uh, for autonomous kinds of devices? So it, it's, it's almost like right now it's what applications aren't going to use it seriously on, on these applications. I, I think everyone... Um, in development teams are looking for options and you know we we are being surprised by customers in an environment where you never think they would use that kind of technology they're using it um, the the two pieces are training and inference you know in my slide here I said you know very clearly some of those performance numbers on inference once the training has occurred and now you need to make decisions is that a dog or a cat or whatever it might be the advantage of this kind of technology is significant. So, you know, part of the cloud deployment um, is twofold. One is anything that has inference is uh, a good opportunity for this type of technology, FPGA with SOC. And the second right now, which, you know, I urge you, actually, I didn't mention this, uh, if you're interested, is in the actual development yourself. So uh, Amazon has the uh, developers program where you can log in and actually spend by the hour uh, acceleration processor time to experiment. And that's the way a lot of customers are getting on board to make use of that type of bandwidth and performance without going and you know, upgrading their server, server farms or buying more servers and such. So both of those are in play right now when it comes to, to acceleration. But you know, it's the first one that I think is probably the most hope to unlock a lot of this uh, potential that, you know, uh, I think we all see in our lives of, of uh, being helped by getting an answer versus we have to synthesize it all the time. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Thanks for that excellent keynote. I also didn't realize that you moved from, uh, you know, an FPGA, you know, focused company into an all programmable software intelligence and hardware optimization, which is great, brilliant. So. Time to honor you for the great, great speech. So let's have uh, the vice uh, chairman of IESA, Anil Kumar, on stage to uh, give him a momento, please.